Okay, folks, I'd like, like to get started. This is, we're having a uh, full committee work session on interim study of bills. We are not going to uh, dispose of any bill today. This is, uh, this is our start to be able to see where we want to go as a committee with, the, with these bills. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll be dividing up things if we have a, any uh, bills, any uh, what we will do with each, each of these bills. Some bills we will lump into uh, one, one subcommittee, others will be by themselves. Uh, and others will not have any subcommittee. They will just go to the uh, uh, a an, an executive session in September or October. Uh, with that, first, uh, I'd like uh, everyone to rise and so salute the flag. Yes. Representative Harp, please lead us in the pledge. Yes, please join me in a pledge to old glory. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of, of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. Might as well. As we'll get right into the uh, business, uh, Mr. Deers, the rec uh, chair recognizes Mr. Uh, Mr. Deers to give us give the uh, to give us some background and a tutorial, some education around uh, well before 26 and 257 with relative to the. Uh, pollutants from uh, septic systems. Uh, there are two bills that uh, that uh, that deal with this subject, and uh, I uh, asked uh, Mr. Deers to give us a uh, give a, bring us all up to speed as to the uh, what what the science is and what the need is and things of that nature. Uh, Mr. Dears, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. It's great to be with you again. I think uh, everyone's uh, looking refreshed after uh, a little bit of time between the session. Uh, so I hope you're all having a great summer. Um, I am very pleased to talk to you a little bit today um, about sort of the, um, I'm going to call it the Great Bay Saga, uh, because it's been going on for so long. And because many of you are, are relatively new on the committee. Um, it may be that you haven't heard uh, the saga. Um, I'm not going to do it as an ode or anything like that, or in, you know, a song uh, as as perhaps we probably should at this point. But going to just tell you a little bit about the history of sort of how we got here, and the reason for that is to talk a little bit about why uh, Senate Bill 257 is a thing. And so I know Senator Waters is. Uh, is the sponsor of that, and he is behind me here, and I'm sure that he can also wax eloquent uh, about the reasons for this bill. But I'm going to give it a, just a quick shot as to kind of how we got here. So back in the early 2000s, we started doing the State of the Estuary Reports, and this came from the Piscataqua Region Estuaries Partnership. And one of the things that happened as doing those is there are a bunch of indicators, indicators of estuary health. So just to define my terms, an estuary is simply a place where fresh water meets salt water. And the Great Bay is our largest of estuaries, and it's pretty, a significant resource uh, nationally as well as regionally. So the Great Bay was starting to show signs of stress through these indicators. And one of the primary ones was the loss of eelgrass. So eelgrass is a submerged aquatic vegetation, Zostra meridima, for those of you who like the Latin names. Uh, it's quite fun to say. Not as fun as Amophila brevigulata, which is beach grass, but almost as fun. Um, and so, so eelgrass is a fundamental basis of the ecosystem of the estuary. It's where the fish hang out. It's where fish have nurseries. 
There's flounder, have their babies in there. We have, uh, there's shellfish, it cleans the water. So as it waves, it's very long and wavy. And as it waves its, its leaves and, and stems in the water, it captures sediment. It takes up nutrients. And so that was declining precipitously in Great Bay. By between 1996 and around 2000, 2004, about half of the eelgrass in Great Bay was gone. And so they started looking at this. And one of the things that also came up at the same time, looking at all these different indicators, is that nutrients, nitrogen in particular, have increased dramatically over time. And one of the things we know from the research around the world is that nitrogen, too much nitrogen in estuary, tends to impact the eelgrass, which has lots of different than, it's, it's basically a, a, a positive reinforcement, um, it's a, a, or a positive feedback loop. Positive meaning that, that one thing causes the other, leads to the other, leads to the other. And so when you start to lose the, when you start to get too much nutrients, you start to, to have less light. When you have less light, the eelgrass don't get as much light. And then the eelgrass start to die, which then causes you to not trap as much sediments. Then you have less light, which causes more eelgrass to die, which causes the estuary to, to sort of go into this downward spiral. So we had good indications at the time that this was going on. As a result of that, we launched a fairly monumental effort to develop ideas about how much nutrients would have to be reduced in order to, uh, in order to get the estuary to be healthy again. As a result of that, we started to see numbers coming out and, and understanding a little bit more about what would need to be reduced and from where it was coming. There's a chart, a color chart in the middle of your, uh, of your packet there that looks a little bit like um, Pac-Man uh, eating one of those fun dots that Pac-Man eat. And that, um, that color chart there shows you sort of where does all this nitrogen come from? So only about about a third or so comes from wastewater treatment plants. So each of us, every, every year, each of us creates about seven pounds of nitrogen uh, through our bodily functions. That nitrogen all goes to wastewater treatment plants or your septic system or, you know, hopefully, those are the two places it goes. And um, that, uh, that then has to get treated and that nitrogen is generally, uh, because of the way that our wastewater treatment plants were created, they were not meant to treat for nitrogen. So the nitrogen pretty much went through the plants and into the estuary, and that's what the, was one of the sources. The rest of the 75% or so, or 70%, comes from other things, comes from atmospheric deposition. We get a lot of nitrogen that comes from uh, the Midwest through power plants. Uh, you've heard of, when we talk about acid rain, you've heard of NOx and SOx, um, you know, nitric oxides and sulfuric oxides. You know, those are not just Dr. Seuss terms, NOx and SOx. They are these pollutants. And nitrogen uh, precipitates, falls onto the ground, and that washes off into off of pavement and into our estuaries. It, most of it is taken up in forests. This is one of the reasons why it's great that we have so many forests. It takes up that nitrogen. So that nitrogen has to go somewhere. Also, nitrogen comes from fertilizers. Not as much here in terms of agriculture, but certainly um, one of the studies we did showed that we had about 45,000 acres of lawn in the Great Bay watershed, much of which gets fertilizer, much of which has nitrogen in it. So all of this combines, and so by the time we got to the sort of 2010s, uh, it was very clear that there needed to be reductions. So EPA, who writes our permits here for New Hampshire, began looking at what would we have to do. And one of the problems with this whole thing is that EPA really only has its hooks into the wastewater treatment plants. It doesn't have its hooks into those other sources that I suggested. So what, the, so what EPA, because that's their one hook, they began proposing to do draconian reductions at our wastewater treatment plants. Reductions that would be extraordinarily expensive to meet. And so as a result of that, uh, the state and the communities uh, became lots and, lots and lots and lots and lots of discussions over the ensuing 10 years or so. EPA agreed to take a completely novel approach. This is novel for the nation. No one else has done this in this way. And what they did was they created this Great Bay uh, Nitrogen General Permit. 
So what they did was they took the nitrogen part out of the whole permit system that normally wastewater treatment plants are permitted under and created this general permit that applies to the 13 wastewater treatment plants and their communities around the Great Bay. And what that innovative approach did was it set an end of the pipe limit. But the end of the pipe is the end of the Piscataqua River. So it basically looks at the whole watershed, looks at how much nitrogen is coming down on the whole watershed, and then attempts to regulate that based on the whole thing instead of each sort of facility. So then they backed that up into each sort of what each facility was contributing and then allowed them to lock in the good work and the investments that they'd been making over the last 10 years. And just be clear, the communities around Great Bay, Great Bay have dug in. You know that Portsmouth spent $94 million on a new wastewater treatment plant at Pierce Island that has ex excellent nitrogen treatment. Exeter, small Exeter, spent $54 million. Rochester has taken their nitrogen from 40 micrograms per liter down to four micrograms per liter. This is amazing. They've done amazing work, huge investments that have gone on, but it's not quite enough in order to, because they're only 30% of the problem. So the idea with this Great Bay, Nat, uh, Great Bay Nitrogen General Permit was to be able to build in a system of trade-offs. That system of trade-offs trade does not exist within the Clean Water Act. So this is a new tool that was developed for this purpose. It is voluntary. The communities have, can voluntarily go into this. And if they voluntarily go into this, then they, they have to do a few things. They have to contribute to monitoring, so how, what's actually going on in the estuary. They have to track the nitrogen that they're emitting from their communities. So we built a system, DES funded it, to build a system that tracks their pollutants. So any subdivision that goes in or a redevelopment project that's, re, you know, that's putting in new best management practices, all of that is tracked within this, this, um, this, this database. In fact, New Market has done phenomenally, uh, and we've tracked those reductions uh, that they've made from, for, in, in this case, they hooked their elementary school, instead of all of the wastewater going into the, into the to, you know, right to the estuary, they put in infiltration basins. They did some other things, which disconnected all of that impervious. Remember all the nitrogen that's falling from the sky and landing on, the, on that pavement. So the communities have to track what they're doing. They also develop a, a nitrogen reduction plan that addresses those other sources other than their wastewater treatment plant. So they're looking at all of those other sources. So Dover right now, when they put in a new road, when they dig up the side, they don't just put it back with the same uh, storm drain basins. They've actually invented their own sort of water treatment system that goes in front of the, uh, the storm drains that actually causes the nitrogen to essentially filter out as it goes through, as well as other pollutants. Um, it's not just about nitrogen when you start talking about stormwater, it's about flooding, it's about, it's about other, other you know, phosphorus, it's about other pollutants, bacteria that would be in the water. So it's a win-win-win when you do that because not only are you improving your, your, your aged infrastructure, but you're reducing flooding and you get that pollution benefit as well at the same time. This is why this trade-off is so important. But this is also, and this is where we get to the bill. <laughs> This requires you to use a silver buckshot approach, right? There's no silver bullet. It's a silver buckshot approach. So what you need to do is find all of the places that you can possibly reduce nitrogen. I mentioned that each of us creates about seven pounds of nitrogen a year. If you're on a septic system, your septic system does a remarkable job at pulling out all kinds of things out of the water. It pulls out phosphorus, it treats the bacteria, it, it even uh, is pretty good at, at doing things like pharmaceuticals and personal care products. Lots of those things get, get caught up and treated very nicely in your septic system. Nitrogen goes into solution, and septic systems are extremely good at taking things that are in solution and putting them into the ground. That's what they're built to do. So septic systems, the straight up, well-functioning, modern septic system is extremely good at putting nitrogen directly into the groundwater. So when we start talking about can you address this, so for example in Dover, they have a certain population outside of the, the main downtown area that is on septic systems. 
So as they start to think about, again, a silver buckshot approach, how would they start to address putting in expensive upgrades to those systems without requiring the, those, those people who own them to spend that kind of money? That's where this idea about a septic utility comes from. How would the community, so the community Dover could come to the SRF program at DES, get some loan forgiveness as part of that, put that into their normal operating budget as the community, and then create basically a, a utility around that that would put in a, a, an upgraded system that would treat for nitrogen. It would do the maintenance on that system every year, make sure that it's, it's working. The people attached to it would, pay a, would probably pay a fee like you'd pay a sewer fee, but you would no longer have to be responsible for pumping it out. You'd no longer be responsible for replacing it if it broke. Someone else would do that. So if they went down that road and it would take the vote of the, the, the city council and input from all of the you know, people in town as, as part of the public process, if they decided to do that, then they would get credits. Remember I said we built this system where they can track their nitrogen. This would be one of the things that they would be able to track. And at the end of this permit, what they're required to show is that they did what they could to reduce nitrogen and see what's going on in the estuary. And we, we hope and we think that when we get to the end of that, we're going to see major improvements in the ecology of Great Bay. That's where this bill comes out of. It's out of that desire. I think this is going to be very, very rare that this gets employed. I've also talked to some folks around some lake communities that have, say, a small neighborhood that all, you know, was all put in at the same time. Maybe the developer wasn't so reputable. The septic systems are all failing. And that may be another place where that community wants to get together, maybe even a neighborhood sort of association, build a stormwater utility, which the, you know, the law would allow that to happen, and be able to then access funding. Because currently, an individual homeowner, unless you're very poor, there are very few avenues to access funding for septic system re replacement. This would be a place in which that, that new district, that utility, could go after SRF funds. They could get grants. They could do other things that would allow them to spread those payments out and allow people to replace their systems without having to you know, you know, pay a huge amount up front, which is very challenging for people to do. So, that's really the essence of 257, and you know, I, I just wanted to, I'll stop there and see if pe people have questions. I gave you some materials to just kind of show, you know, what do we know about eelgrass? Uh, there's a little chart there on the front. What do we know about total nitrogen? That's from the Kachiko River, and you can see that since Rochester and Dover um, have been doing so much better, especially Rochester here in the Kachiko, since they've been doing so much better at reducing the nitrogen, you see the nitrogen reductions in the river. Um, so we're tracking what's going on there. The second page, I put in just a couple of little factoids about what a stormwater utility is, kind of why those exist. For those of you who are involved in Concord, the Concord is looking at a stormwater utility. The primary reason there is that something like 40% of the pavement in this city is either owned, is, is untaxable by the city. So that means that all of the runoff is paid for by the, the, by the good people of Concord in their taxes, whereas to treat that stormwater in a utility, everyone would pay uh, a little bit and it would you know, be able to, to raise more dollars to deal with the serious problems that exist with aging infrastructure, as well as spread that across the um, people who are currently untaxed. Um, and I sort of talked a little bit about the septic utility. And then, you know, one of the other things that's come up is septic impacts on lakes. And I can certainly talk more about that in the context of uh, HB 426. But, you know, we are definitely in a situation in which cyanobacteria blooms are getting worse and worse. This year, the first time we had two water supply lakes that had cyanobacteria blooms. So this is very scary stuff because of the toxins involved in the cyanobacteria. So, um, you know, I think this is another place in which there needs to be some, some thought addressing uh, potential pollution sources into our, our lakes. So I'm going to stop there and see if people have questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deers, for an excellent presentation. Um, 
I wanted to just get some clarification on the home septic systems. Sure. You said if this, if a community were to uh, take advantage of this enabling legislation, if this bill were to become law or something similar, you said um, in lake communities where septic systems are failing, this could help the homeowner whose system was failing, say, for instance, if it was installed poorly, sure. um, some remediation, financial remediation. And then you, I thought you said that they wouldn't be having to pump their tanks themselves anymore. So could you clarify how sure. this would work? Yeah. I Again, mean, I think this is going to be super rare that this happens, but it will happen on occasion. I can picture... I can picture any number of neighborhoods around lakes that were all kind of put in at the same time, and they're all their septic systems are failing at the same time. Um, it's pretty common. And so one of the things that could happen is say that, that group, that homeowner group, decides that they want to build a, a district, uh, basically a utility. And when you do that, because these systems, again, if you're going to go with some advanced systems or something like that, you could have the utility handle all of the maintenance on that. And in fact, you would want to do that to protect your, your investment. It would be similar to a, to a wastewater system that now, um, you know, they, they treat the pipes all the way to your house. Uh, they do other things. This would be sort of that next step where they would actually, you know, depending on how the utility is set up, they would most likely do the maintenance on that. So you'd pay a fee into it every year, and that would pay the, the amortization of, you know, the cost of the, the putting all these systems in as well as it would fund the maintenance over time. That's a, that's a place in which that would definitely need all of the homeowners <laughs> to agree that that's what they want to do. This is why I think it's going to be really rare, um, but I think it's going to be really helpful in certain circumstances in which there are a few other options. Sewering is not an option, for example. Um, there are parts of Lake Winnipesaukee that, you know, the Winnipesaukee Basin Project didn't go all the way around the lake. So there's whole areas that don't have, and there's some tight neighborhoods in there that could potentially do this sort of thing. Um, and then, of course, I think Great Bay was the focus. That was the original way that this bill was written, was for those Great Bay communities. And that's kind of the description, I think, which is probably more likely in the short run, would be you know as part of a larger effort, a larger system that would you know be pulling some of those in. Thanks. Uh, for a question, Representative Spain. Here we go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this uh, this system that's being put in um, is it like a mini wastewater treatment plant? What is it? So thank you for the question, Representative Spain. Um, what they have is a number of different kinds of systems, and the whole the the way that you get nitrogen out of water is that you have to alternate back and forth between an anaerobic environment and an aerobic environment. Your septic system is only anaerobic. There's not much oxygen down in there. So what happens is essentially it would go into some sort of a, a, a mechanical system, be small, you know, because it's part of your, just part of your, your septic system, but it would have some way of introducing oxygen back into the system at some point in the process. Some of them are more elaborate than others. So some of them would have ways of recirculating some of the waste back in through the system because the more you can, because what happens is that as you put air in, the, the, there's bacteria, natural bacteria, that take the nitrogen and, denit and denitrify it, which means that they send it up into the oxygen. Our oxygen, as you all know, is mostly nitrogen. Our, our atmosphere is mostly oxygen, is mostly nitrogen, not oxygen. Anyway, um, so it sends it up into the atmosphere. In order, what happens then is all, as those little bugs are chewing up the nitrogen, they chew up all the carbon because that's their fuel. And so you have, sometimes you have to have a way of putting more carbon back in, which is coming back out of your waste. That's how a waste retrieval plant works. But this is really, it's, it would look mostly like a septic system, but might have a little mechanical structure that would sit, you know, as part some at some point in the process. That's how some of these work. There's other ones that are now being laid out that are more passive, where they put um, a layer of wood chips or other kinds mm -hmm. of carbon media underneath your leach field, and that has the effect of again 
being able to have some of that carbon to be able to take up. Further question. Further question. Thank you. So uh, I had envisioned all of these houses being hooked up to a central plant, but it's actually occurring on each septic system. Um, on the Shoreland Commission that I chaired, uh, we talked a lot about innovative systems, for, sure. for, particularly for areas that were very close to the shore right. and where you really couldn't put in a decent septic system. How does that relate to this utility? It's very similar. Um, the, 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 treatments, the treatment protocols for phosphorus are different than they are for nitrogen. So around a lake, you're talking about it, but it's a similar kind of system. You know, it'd be similar sort of sort of approach where you have some sort of system, and most likely it includes some sort of mechanical parts. This is why the maintenance becomes so critical. This is why a utility becomes critical, is that you basically have to have a some sort of third party maintenance to keep this to keep them going. And the homeowner is you know, because they're they they move. Most people, a lot of people buy a house, they don't even know where the septic system is. They don't even know that they have a septic system often. So, you know, it, that's why this kind of thing becomes necessary is to have that kind of centralized infrastructure to be able to deal with that. So that, that's kind of where it works. One more clarification. Thank you. So the, um, would this utility pay for a landowner, a property owner to upgrade from a standard system to one of these innovative systems? That's generally what would be involved, especially okay. like take, take the Great Bay example, take the Dover example. So they would identify, say, an area of the town that would, had the highest potential for redu reduction of nitrogen. Because remember, the towns are going, this is a value engineering proposition, okay? They're doing whatever is the least cost next pound of nitrogen removal. So th that's, the, that's the whole premise here. It's not that they're targeting one thing or another because, it, because of, of some reason. It's because they're, char they're targeting the next pound of cheapest nitrogen. It's pure economics. And so if the next pound of cheapest nitrogen to get out is through some set of septic systems, and the cost of that, given the whole re replacement of the system, you know, the maintenance of the system, doing all of that makes sense then and there and there's grants and there's and there's there's loans to be able to do that that may be the cheapest next pound and so that's where this would come into play it wouldn't be willy-nilly it would be as a result of that kind of analysis right thank you yeah i uh, have a question yes sir being being kind of slow i need to uh does this mean that uh, we can forget about uh, leach fields from now on? <laughs> so thank you for the question, <laughs> Mr. Chair. The answer is no. For, for the vast majority of people, anywhere you, you are in the state who has a septic system, that system is perfectly adequate. And even if you had an advanced system, almost always you would also have a leach field of some sort. So you still have to get the water back into the ground somewhere. You still not, you can't make the water disappear. So it's highly unlikely that you would have the system that would go into the little treatment hut. We'll call it a treatment hut, the treatment cabana that would be in your backyard. And then that water would then flow directly into a lake. That would never happen. You would still be needing to put that water back into the ground. And the best way to put that back into the ground is through a leach field because it spreads it out and it has a media underneath it that continues to even give it more treatment. For those of you who haven't seen a septic system get dug up, I, I recommend you see it at some point because the, the, the engine of treatment, that treat, the, the thing that treats all the bacteria and all of the other nasties that are coming, coming out of the house is this almost microscopic thin layer of biological film that occurs on the outside of the stones at the bottom of your leach field. It's truly magical how this system works. I know, I get excited about septic systems, but it's not just a hole in the ground in which one pours water. These are highly engineered, well thought out, and they're biological engines that are, that are, that are truly a miracle of public health.
Any other questions on this? Members of the committee? Representative Smith? Actually, Mr. Chair, um, are we also going to discuss the other bill, um, 426, or is this a combined discussion? This is combined. Okay. Uh, Representative Grassi. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd, I'd like to thank you also for pointing out the work that Rochester's done, my hometown. And uh, because I know over the years that I served on the city council, we did a lot of work on getting our water quality and our wastewater treatment plant to be one of the best in the state of New Hampshire. And it's great that you point out, but it's also at the, been at the expense of millions of dollars to the ratepayers in the, in the community. And it's also interesting because I've done a lot of research in looking at sequencing back, batch reactors if for small uses. And uh, because I know it's something that's been significantly done in Western Massachusetts for residential communities or downtown areas that they don't have the septic systems available to them. And there's a lot of innovative stuff out here. Do you see these bills as being a way to encourage more of that to occur in the state of New Hampshire? Thank you for the question, uh, Representative. Um, and, um, and, and Rochester's fantastic. They're, they're doing, they you. really are doing innovative stuff in Rochester. The, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess that's the, the answer is that, that there's a lot of people looking at decentralized systems in lots of new ways uh, for, for a lot of reasons. Cost, you know, the amount of treatment that has to happen. Um, and so, you know, the, the cost of a new wastewater treatment plant is, you know, for, you know, a million gallons a day is, is on the order of $25 million. And, and there's a lot of communities that just aren't going to have that kind of money. So, you know, this is, these, there are a lot of new treatment uh, technologies that are being developed um, worldwide uh, to deal with the, the issue of human waste. So, you know, potentially, so you could say, like, if you had a number of, of decentralized villages, say, for example, and each of them, you know, wanted to do some sort of a system, you could, again, develop some sort, sort of a utility that would deal with that. Um, so I don't know. I mean, that, that, I think that that's sort of, you know, speculative at this point. I don't think we're there yet. Well, with the housing issue that we have here in the state, there's a lot of areas that could sustain additional housing and, and high density, higher density housing if there was a way to treat the wastewater, because sure. that seems to be when you take a look at the calculations for minimum lot size for housing units and the number of bedrooms you have on a site, it, sometimes it becomes prohibitively expensive to be able to, to make a compact, compact housing. And to be able to do these, you know, as I was wondering, I know that batch reactors have been out there for years. I've been looking at them for over 20 years. And having those to be able to support increased density in housing in some areas which would normally not be able to support it, would it, you know, would it be affordable? As I said, a lot of places in Western Massachusetts have done them uh, to support that and, and in some very innovative ways at a far reduced cost to spending $25 million to build a sewage treatment plant. Uh, so it's something that we possibly should be looking at in the short term in order to try to bring these technologies to the state of New Hampshire and using more of them. Yeah, you know, I think that community systems are incredibly important. You see this a lot at, um, you know, at uh, co-op communities where, and, and this is one of the problems that we have right now. And one of the reasons why DES is allocating a significant amount of both ARPA and infrastructure money towards disenfranchised communities is towards the co-ops that oftentimes when they bought up the co-op, the, the systems that were there had not been maintained. Mm -hmm. And so they're installing community systems. And I certainly think that there's an opportunity in the future for either having you know, sort of a utility approach to their community systems, either multiple systems, or being able to have some innovative approaches to being able to deal with that. But that's, you know, I think that's really, the, that's, in, in my mind, that's where the, the first place where you're going to see that kind of approach is, is out of necessity in some of these, especially, you know, places that, that just, when they bought, when they bought up their, 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 their co-op, you know, it was at the outside edge of what people could afford. And then you have a water and sewer problem on top of that. Mm -hmm. And that's what really becomes a problem uh, for folks. And, and we've seen that around the state. Thank you. More questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, I'm going to raise some of the issues of some of my colleagues in terms of the cost to the private property owner. Um, I, I think a lot of us, myself included, thought that this was going to be something that was going to be, say, citywide, 
So the, the council would be approving it. Um, you, you would be dragged in by the majority, whether, whether or not you wanted to be paying for this. Um, but you're saying that that's not the way it will work. Is there any fear that the private uh, resident would be, in some terms, forced to do this? And what would be the cost comparison between they're paying into this utility and they're paying to maintain their own system, possibly replacing it. So th I th thank you for the question. And I think that this is really why I think the committee would benefit from hearing from some additional expertise on this issue of how utilities work and how they would be costed out and how they would be looking at that. Because I think that there are ways to address that in, in, in HB 256. Seven? Seven. Did I give it? I just lost it out of my head for a second. Um, that I think that there may be ways, and I think Senator Waters probably has great ideas on how to do that already. Uh, I'm sure he does. Um, but th I think that this is why maybe a subcommittee might want to look at this. Is It's really, I think, that's the, the crux of people need to understand what would be the implications and, and how would it, uh, the individual homeowner know what those implications are. I think that we heard that as a valid concern as this went through the, the testimony process earlier this session. And I think it's something that, that we could probably benefit from some additional expertise coming in and chatting with you about. Okay. Follow-up. We'll follow um, so I think um, even though it's done little micro community by micro community and the people in say a, that subdivision would hopefully unanimously decide that they want to do it. Nevertheless, it's the municipality, the city council, that needs to enact the legislation that we're offering them. In order to the, for those little micro communities to do this and to access all of the state money in order to do that. Have I got that right? Yeah, they would have, it would have, I mean, in the course of a city, it would certainly have to go through their city council. Um, you can't just, you know, start doing stuff <laughs> without that kind of, and because it would have money involved. It would have expenditure involved. So all of that would have to go through, you know, the public process through their city council. A wee follow-up. So would that be that project by project would have to be approved by the city council or the city council would just say, now we're unable to do this and anywhere that, mm. and any of these little subcommittees want to do it, you now have the ability. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I think it would totally depend on how you set up the utility. Right. This was. This is why I think you know each one of these is going to be different, and it's going to be different just the way that every you know utility in the state is slightly different. Um, they do slightly different things in different ways. They have different fee schedules. They you know they do a lot of, and it's ba because of the particulars of that situation. So I, I think that you know, and, and again, I think it would be good to bring in some city officials to ask them that question. You know, what would have to happen in order for this to move forward if it were, if, if authorizing legislation were passed? You know, how would you go about doing this? Okay, thank you. Representative Smith. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you again, um, Mr. Deers. Um, when I'm looking at, I'm talking about now House Bill 426, and I think, you know, I can't imagine there's anyone who doesn't want to prevent the flow of nitrogen or the results of a failed septic system into any of our lakes or rivers. But if I'm looking at the statute as it stands now, um, it says if a septic, and this is, has to do with the uh, assessment study, the site assessment study. I mean, someone gave me this handout. I don't know if it was you or if Representative Spang. Um, if in section uh, Roman 8, if the septic disposed system designer during the course of the site assessment discovers evidence that there is sewage discharge on the ground surface or directly into surface waters, the designer shall notify in writing the department and the health officer and shall include information in the site assessment report. And then in the letter that DES sent us in testimony last year, uh, it, it suggested changing this to if the septic system is in failure. 
And I wondered what the definition of failure is and if that needs to be tweaked. I'm trying to figure out how we can get to yes on this bill, not necessarily this bill, but the concept sure. to better protect the water from failed septic systems. Yeah, this is, uh, thank you for the question. And um, I, unfortunately, I, I'm, I, I'm getting up to speed on septic the rules and such yeah. um, in my new position, <laughs> but but Rob Tardif, who was our expert, retired at the end of May. So so, oh. but I will I, I certainly have looked at this a little bit, and I will speak to it as well as I can. Mm -hmm. There has been a controversy in the whole way in which septic systems have been looked at between, and, and these are these these are not just semantics between the word um, evaluation. And and um, and eval evaluation and assessment. So those are two really different things. And who does the evaluation or the assessment is also important because there are different levels of qualification. So, for example, and uh, there are people who can simply do the wet sneaker test. So we call it the wet sneaker test. If it, if you go out and you're sloshing around on top of the septic system, it's in failure, right? I mean, that's that's clearly not working correctly. Right. The pure definition of failure in our in our statutes is that it does not meet the requirements of separation between the system and the groundwater table. Okay. So purely speaking, that's the definition of of failure, and it's very easy to figure that out. You have you 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 auger a hole. You find out how deep the water table is. You know how deep the septic system is because you had a design, and you can compare the two. So it's very simple to do that, but it's not the wet sneaker test. And so this is really the crux of this whole uh, the, the whole that part of the bill is really about what is that what is it that will protect buyers and sellers. Right. Yeah. You know, what is it that protects the, the seller from someone coming back at them saying you sold me a failed system or the, the buyer from buying something that says, yeah, I just bought I just bought a pig and a poke. Right. So so that's the crux of this bill. And I think that this bill can be improved. <laughs> and I think we heard testimony from yeah. various different people that suggested that there may be ways of improving it. Um, you know, and I think from the, the septic system commission, that was five years last year, it was just last year. Okay. I was thinking of other commissions, um, that Madam chair has chaired the, um, that, uh, you know, there, there are a number of different recommendations within this, and these were a couple of the common sense ones. And so I think that, you know, those are things that could be addressed, um, to, to better, to improve this bill if the committee so desire. And I think we've thought about this, and I, I mentioned this just in my little tidbits here, because I think we have some thoughts at DES, again, about, you know, let's let's focus this on the things that are most important. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Uh, this Thank is, you. you've been, uh, we remember, this is going to a subcommittee, subcommittee. so let's right. not, but the committee, the committee is going to be voting on whether to send it to subcommittee or not, right? Uh, no, that's my job. Oh, that's your job. Well, I'll just turn this off. <laughs> um, just to follow up um, for everybody's uh, edification, the commission himself got kind of tangled up for a while. It looks to me like it's possible for a property to pass the assessment because the assessment is just somebody looking at a map and looking at the wetlands and saying, yeah, this, this site is capable of holding a septic system of, with the, the number of bedrooms that are being proposed. But it doesn't say anything about whether the septic system is, that's in there is functioning properly. So it'd be possible to get a good assessment and have a, a failing system Pro, if you did an evaluation of the system itself. Yeah, th this is where I think we, the, the committee would, de uh, would, would benefit from some additional testimony. 
hearing from people who actually do this for a living and understanding the, the, the nuances. Again, these are sort of magical things that sit in our backyards. Um, and so understanding a little bit more about, you know, how do we really understand the, the health of those and that they're doing the right thing and that a, that a buyer is buying what they think they are and a seller is selling what they think they are. You know, this, this is, uh, it's an important aspect. And so I, I, again, I think that that's why, you know, hearing some additional testimony from folks who, who are out there, um, you know, digging, you know, digging in the dirt, uh, would be helpful. Great. Thank you. Uh, I know there's a lot more questions. I know I have a lot more questions, but I'll save those for the subcommittee. Uh, but is there any other issue, any, anything else that uh, is of concern relative to this? Or do you have additional comments you want to make? You've, you've given us a lot to think about. I, I think I've done quite enough speaking to you today, unless you need more. <laughs> uh, I can always use more. No, not how. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes, we do. We, we I, are. Will, I will. I uh, will. I'll be here all day. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, well, we'll we'll uh, toward the end. I was gonna uh, try to take up not all of them, just get a an overall view of the uh, of the PFAS bills. Maybe we now that you're yeah you're here, uh, you know. I would. Uh, I don't want to see you go and then have to come back. I'm. I'm happy to take a walk and come back at any moment, right, uh, Mr. Chair. Well, but whatever. It would, uh, we, we, we want to just go fast through the PFAS bills, and I think uh, we'll then uh, be able to. All right. We. Uh, what? We have the. the uh, do you, have you gotten? A, well, do you have a copy uh, of all of the? P, or of the PFAS builds? Yes, sir, I do. Okay. Uh, by the way, anybody, everybody have their copy of this? Uh, yeah, if you, if you want it, I made, I made some additional copies. This, these are all of the, 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 the uh, builds that we are retaining. Uh, anybody else in the committee? You need one also? Yeah, a couple. Yeah, it's... This this was put together by uh, by our by our committee uh, committee researcher, and she did a fantastic job. It's better than having the bills, believe me, in front of you. Uh, just to uh, just to try. Uh, do we have a copy of that? Of these? Oh. Okay. Uh, I mean, if you want a hard copy. Uh. Okay. All right. We're just uh, just going down the going down the just going down the list. Uh, Eleven sixty seven. Uh, the establishing a maximum containment level for perfluorinated chemicals in surface water. Uh, uh, basically, we're monitoring. Uh, let's see. Committee recommends interim study to allow us to evaluate these bills together with the new DES standards and return the body necessary legislation uh, to protect New Hampshire's pristine waters. Uh, the uh, this is awareness of dangers, uh, establishing a maximum contaminant level for perfluorinated chemicals in surface water. That's 1167. Uh, we're we're basically uh, just monitoring it, and uh, with uh, uh, just to see how uh, uh, it uh, how DES is doing relative to uh, the uh, relative to that to this bill, the contaminant. Uh, you have this, do you, you have that in front of you? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Any, any comment on this? Uh, DES was opposed to this bill for a variety of reasons. Yeah. And really this comes down to the fact that this is a highly changing environment. Um, mm -hmm. And as people may have seen last week, there was a new notification from EPA. They're starting to look at some health guidance. And what we heard from that, the important take home from that is that EPA is working on MCLs 
uh, yeah. that will help to inform the state process. So, you know, I think that this is one of these where by the time we get around to hearing what EPA comes up with, having it go through the public process that they're going to go through, because they're going to go through a public, you know, public comment and all of that vetting process. We're going to be a year from now, really, before we hear what EPA is really coming mm -hmm. up with. So this is a bill that, that that I think would be, you know, I think in September of 2023, that may be ripe again for some new legislation. But at this point, you know, we've developed some of the most highly protective uh, policies in the in the nation. We're so far ahead of most of the nation on this issue that we feel like this is the, the, the time right now is to, you know, let the science catch up and let the policy catch up from the federal level to where we've been because we've been so far out in front and we'll have much better information for you a year from now. Thank you. Any uh, other questions on, on this issue and this one? I'll skip uh, Senator Post. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to know what an MCL is. So an MCL is a maximum contaminant limit. And it's simply a number that if you get above that, it's uh, not good for people to drink. So, you know, the maximum contaminant levels that have been established for some of the PFAS chemicals, so for, you know, P P PFOA and PFOS, you know, we developed those. They're in the parts per trillion range. Um, you know, we have lots of other MCLs about lots of other things from nucleotides to you know, halogens to all kinds of different, uh, these MCLs for drinking water. Okay, uh, 14, House Bill 1440, uh, relative to surface water quality standards for perfluorinated chemicals. Go right ahead, your comments. I testified on this bill uh, back in, Looks like February, uh, we addressed this one. Actually, no, it was January 25th that we uh, had that hearing uh, here in front of you. And uh, at that point, the department was opposed to the bill. Um, interestingly, since then, uh, EPA has now come out with some additional draft um, criteria that would apply for aquatic life. So, you know, one of the things that we said when we developed our plan uh, we, as you recall, there was a, a bill that required us to develop a plan by January of 2020 to look at how we were going to be regulating PFAS compounds in surface waters. As part of that plan, one of the things that we identified was the huge expense of developing our own criteria because of the amount of exp uh, basically new science that had to be developed. EPA is finally developing that science. There are some draft numbers on the street that will be out probably in, in a year or so. In the meantime, we are well on our way to developing rules for uh, water quality standards. That will go into effect hopefully by next January. We're about to publish a draft of those rules, which will take the MCLs um, that, that Representative Post asked about. It will put those into our surface water standards where they apply for drinking water sources. So the way that we apply that is uh, upstream 20 miles of, of a drinking water intake from a surface water. So that's that criteria that, you're, that, that goes into the groundwater standard today. That's what MCLs develop, deal with the groundwater. Those numbers will be the same numbers for surface waters for surface water sources of drinking water, by, hopefully by January or so. So we're getting very close to entering the formal rulemaking process on that. So the, this bill is essentially I, I think we're already doing what it's telling uh, us to do. And, uh, and, and this is such a hot topic that, you know, we're going to be in front of you uh, for a very long time uh, on, a, on an annual basis talking about this. So I, I think that, that this rule, this, this law, again, is going to be um, uh, overridden by, by both action that DES has already taken as well as federal science that's going to inform it in the future. Representative uh, Grassi. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairs, would this bill serve a purpose, you know, if we introduced it in the fall and you're saying it could be January before we find out what we want to do, could this bill be a vehicle to amend in January or February 
to allow you to enact some of the stuff that's coming down from the federal government that you want to put into law? Thank you for the question, Representative. I, I think that we're a year away from really having all the information that we want. When I said January, that's going to be when we're going to have rules published. So, so we, were all, we will already be down the road by then. So I don't know that there's anything new that we're going to know between now and the next session that's going to necessi necessitate some additional regulation. Ms. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you again, Mr. Deers. Um, when you say the rules uh, will be published in January, does that mean that will be when the public hearings begin no, on no. those? No, no. Thank you for asking the question. No, we intend to be having public hearings in the fall. Perfect. Thank you. No, I want to have the rules finalized by January. I'd like to. Okay. Re remember, in September, we are going, the, we will be the time we will be, be the, uh, actually disposing of the interim, interim study. So September and October. So this is just a catch. This is just a checkup. Uh, renaming the Department of Environmental Services, the Department of Environmental Protection. Don't even bother to, to don't 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 even comment on that. <laughs> and assigning the Department oversight to private drinking water wells. Uh, I think it goes without saying that this was something that um, that the department was not uh, in favor of, uh, particularly. Yeah. Um, certainly, the, the renaming would be extraordinarily expensive. Yeah. Um, and unclear as to what the benefit would be. Um, and also, just from a, I will tell you, living inside of DES, the <laughs> services piece is really important to us. Uh, we take that very seriously at DES. We intend to provide excellent customer service, and if we're not, we like to hear about it because we. We really do have that as part of our ethos. Yep. Um, and in, in terms of the, the drinking water piece, um, we believe that we already have the authority to do what you suggested. Oh, and look who's behind me. Thank goodness. Oh, Saved by the bell. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Uh, Mark Samborn, Assistant Commissioner of New Hampshire DES. Uh, the commissioner asked me to come down on this bill in particular. Uh, we testified um, before... We have, uh, we would be very um, strongly opposed to renaming the department, both for the increase in cost and the, um, as Ted was about starting to explain, and he's been in the department a lot longer than I have. Um, we really do think that uh, the Department of Environmental Services much more represents the culture and the approach we like to take in terms of being customer service, um, not. Uh, the seeming to be more draconian um, the uh, the other name and the, what's associated with the protection you know where we're here to provide services to the public and help them accomplish their goals and their projects while obviously keeping our uh, resources safe so the commissioner asked me to come down and make sure uh, we uh, re supported Ted in delivering that message you have a question All right. of course all right, of course. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Assistant Commissioner. It's the first time I've met you. Um, I have, uh, well, th there's two parts of this. The first one is I know that, that there's been a lot of concern for a long time that every other environmental agency in New England has the word protection in it that they don't see them, their, their duty as to facilitate uh, development, et cetera. But I respect what you're saying, and I can certainly see the logic of that. I'd like to address the second part of it. Um, I got very involved with some of you guys over there at DES with the problem of arsenic in drinking water and um, trying to get people in my community to be testing and send those test results into DES. I believe D arsenic is an um, overlooked and very large problem in this state. Um, if DES doesn't do it, who will, who will make sure that we begin to address the problem of arsenic in private drinking water wells? So I'll I'll speak, but this is also one. Ted 
add in anything. Um, you know, we actually feel um, we already have the ability to um, request permission to access folks' um, private property. There's a process, um, you know, it, when we testified the first time when this bill was up, um, we talked to our staff and staff has, you know, it's never, you know, access has never been a, a, a problem in terms of determining uh, testing wells. And so, um, and, and there's a process in place that has always worked for us. So um, it's not that we don't uh, agree in terms of the intent. We just think this goes beyond what's needed and our current process and what's in uh, statute um, works for us. And um, the few times there are problems, you know, we can work with the town and figure out, you know, hacks. But uh, staff has, has said we're very comfortable in terms of our existing process and our, our ability to, you know, as you know, for the PVAS, we've done more testing on private than, mm -hmm. you know, percentage wise in almost any um, uh, state in the country. And uh, we've been able to do that very successfully working with the homeowners and our existing authorization. Ted, is there anything you want to add? Well, to, to that issue, I think certainly you, you, you covered. In terms of arsenic, um, certainly that's an, an issue. And one of the things that DES did, uh, was it two years ago, we uh, launched a program that would get point of, uh, point of use treatment for arsenic to people who have wells for anyone who was either expecting uh, a child or, or wanted to be expecting mm -hmm. a child. And those are the most vulnerable populations for arsenic. The wastewater treatment plant or the water treatment plants, the, the community systems around the state um, recently, you know, the, the MCL was recently lowered for arsenic. So, so people are starting to, th that's happening, that, that's getting treated. Uh, wells and individual wells is certainly a concern and it's one that the DES continues to have. I don't think this, 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 this particular bill <laughs> was the vehicle to deal with that. Uh, but there certainly, um, you know, we have been, been encouraging people to get their wells tested for arsenic. We oh, encourage yes. people to get their wells tested for lots of things. Um, and making, uh, I think, this point of treatment, point of use treatment available, especially for vulnerable populations, I, I think is going to be the, the approach that is, that, that is, is prudent at this point. You can't make someone test their well, because this is really about your personal, your personal health. It's what you're drinking out of your faucet, and so you know it's different when it's a community system because you don't get to control what's in that. But when you're in your own home, you, you know you you do. And so I think that this is one of those touchy places in which we would like to be helpful. And if there's thoughts around the, you know, the state on how we can be more helpful, especially to vulnerable <laughs> populations, you know, I think that that's something that we would love to talk with people about. Uh -huh. But at this point, I don't know that there's a legislative remedy for, you know, for this issue of, of individual well owners um, and, and their desire to get their water tested. This bill wouldn't be that. This bill is really about entering someone's house if there's that's right. some other issue going on. And I don't think yeah. that was like that's going to happen. Not, not in not in this state, or at least. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> will this have a subcommittee? No, this will not have a subcommittee. Yeah, I, this. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the two different issues. I, I think we'd be happy to follow up with you about this. The specific issue you're talking about, um, I, I don't think this bill would um, achieve your ultimate goal that you're you're looking to achieve. We. We have the ability right now to work with homeowners and, and test their wells. And if it's part of a larger testing and um, or if something's going on locally and that process has always worked and we've, uh, you know, our staff assures us we've never had a problem um, working with the homeowner to, to test. And um, we, we don't feel um, this would uh, benefit the process in any way. Okay, maybe we can talk later. Uh, 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 moving right along. Uh, we'll, uh, oops, excuse me. Uh, House Bill 1602 relative to perfluorinated chemicals in drinking water. Uh, that was, uh, uh, that had to do with uh, uh, the Representative Grassi's uh, uh, similar bill. We had uh, someone, uh, 
came in and did speak to us about that. When, when was that? Uh, right, a little bit, a little, of course, a month or two ago. Uh, was it? Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and I, there's there's no one here to testify. I don't think on that. That I think we're up to date on that. Then. Uh, well, I, and he I said he would be back uh, uh, later on with additional information, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And I, but I think it, it's information we may be getting during the summer. Yep. Uh, exactly. But uh, the thing is, as well, is if this bill was similar to the lead bill, which we passed. Mm -hmm. Yes. As far as uh, monitoring and reporting out uh, right. a number of things that were in 1421, I think it was, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, which is on the governor's desk. Yep. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it may be something that we want to take a look at as part of you know, I, I would say if you if you're planning on putting some of these um, these PFAS bills together in a committee, that we just sort of slip this one in there and and have it sitting there, whether we do anything with it or not, it uh, I think would something that the committee would at least be able to take testimony from the state if they had any if DES have has any further stuff that they would receive that information. Going on, uh, House Bill, the last one I think. Uh, on PFAST is 1618, uh, adding several perfluorinated chemicals to the list uh, of per and polyfluorinated fluoroalkyl substances with maximum contaminant level and establishes cumulative total, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, do, you, do you have a comment on that? Uh, Thank you. This was uh, a bill that, again, I think we it's, it's very similar to 1167. Yep. Um, and we had some of the similar testimony on that. The DES was opposed mm -hmm. to that yep. for a number of reasons, mostly because the, the, the actual numbers that were being proposed, we do not think were supported yet in the science. And so the challenge that we had there was really that the scientific evidence relative to PFBA and PFBS would essentially, um, were not supported yet by the, the scientific research that we had seen. We also had concerns about combining different kinds of PFAS into a combined number. And the reason for that is that they have different effects. Different chemicals have different effects on the human body. And so we didn't feel that we, we have not felt, and we have, we've, we've testified on this any number of times, that we do not feel it is appropriate at this point, given what we know today, to, com to combine them into a combined number. Uh, and, and so this is, this is again, part of the, the, the sort of nuances of, of PFAS and how they're being regulated around the country. But in our estimation, this is not yet an appropriate way to develop these kinds of numbers uh, in a combined manner. So those were the tests. That's the testimony we gave. Um, again, we're going to see EPA come out with a whole raft of new science, stuff that's coming out of an academy of science, and we'll know a lot more about what, this, what some of these chemicals are and what they're doing, um, or at least what we know about them. Uh, or, over the next uh, you know, six to nine months, we'll have a much better understanding, at least of the newest science. And that's the last of the of the PFAS bills. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. uh, yes. uh, do you have a question? Uh, any more? Uh, any? I, I don't want to. This is. We are going to be this. Uh, there are not. There's. I will not be uh, calling a, any uh, convening a uh, work session on the these any of these PFAS bills. They will go. They they will be taken up at the executive sessions that we will have in uh, September and October. So the, I'm not not forming any subcommittee on. Uh, the PFAS bills.
Okay. Uh, let's get uh, let's House Bill fourteen ninety establishing. Pardon? He's got no phone. Oh, we're, 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 I'm excused. Sorry. You you yes, you're excused. I don't think there's anything much more we can right. ask. The the TED talk has ended. Uh, um, <laughs> thank you for being yes. here today. Yeah. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you. Senator uh, Waters. Senator Waters. We have a 257. All right, sure. Oh, it's good. Now, remember, this will be before a, a subcommittee, so. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, Senator David Waters, <laughs> District uh, 4. And um, just a couple quick words on uh, 257. I really appreciate Ted Deer's thorough explanation of what's happening with the Great Bay and really the extraordinary nature of the agreement with the EPA because they are ready with a sledgehammer to come down and cost us hundreds of millions of dollars more if we don't get the deal with the nitrogen. I wanted to pass around um, the bill as introduced and just point this out as some options for you. Um, the bill is introduced, you'll see on lines 8 to 10, just applied to the Great Bay communities, those folks who are under the MS4 mandate. So that was the original bill. Um, Senator Guida, who's particularly interested in the lakes and his you know, legislation about al algal blooms and other things, um, suggested two things. One was that it be expanded to potentially include other areas beyond the Great Bay. And then secondly, uh, you'll see in the amended bill, Senator Guida particularly thought we ought to have cost estimates so that town councils and city councils would, and town meetings would have a thorough understanding of if they set up a district, what kinds of expenses might be involved for the taxpayers. Makes a lot of sense. Um, it might be easiest for the committee and the subcommittee to think about separating out whether we just do the Great Bay communities now because we are under the CPA mandate and there are communities who are forming stormwater utilities and this would be useful to them to save money for the taxpayers right now and that perhaps the issue of the lakes is one that could be addressed in um, in other legislation. So that's all I wanted to suggest Mr. Chairman and thank you. Any questions? Hearing none. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Moving, moving right along. Uh, let's look. Let's go down the list. Uh, House, House Bill fourteen ninety eight, establishing a safety program for off highway recreational uh, vehicles. And snowmobiles, uh, Senator Vegan. This uh, this is your bill. Uh, could you bring us up to date on it uh, and just uh, uh, where you think where where uh, if you think it might want to go? Uh, uh, we're talking. We're consideration about uh, folding it in, uh, bringing it before uh, the the. Uh, the uh, uh, 11 House Bill, is it 1188 Committee uh, Commission? But uh, it's, I, don't know, I, I haven't seen it approved yet, uh, signed. Uh, do you, where do you think it, where do you think this ought to be? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I am inclined to ask for the commission, if so, then created into law to take up this uh, in speaking with Fish and Game and the Insurance Department and um, other uh, trade associations involved in the bill. That would be the wisest place for it to be uh, moved forward. And a lot of them have agreed that it would actually be a top priority of that commission. Um, so I think we'd be able to take a good look at um, the, as well the differences between the two industries that are impacted, OHRV versus snowmobiles. Um, so while this bill was well-intentioned, um, I think the commission would be able to sort of yep. separate it out, see what parts overlap that are worthwhile that apply to both, uh, 
ridership as well as be able to figure out what are specific needed for for the distinct ridership of each or uh, community. I think so. My inclination is to do that. I guess I was hoping that I would learn today of the commission's status. So that would be my one question on this. Or eleven eighty eight. Uh, represent, representative representative post yes thank you um um is there anything in this um that addresses the fact that some um railways and things are not no longer um being indemnified um by their insurance companies for ridership no, there's not, and that is that was an important part that I think I wanted to have as a discussion. I did have a, a couple uh, initial discussions, courtesy of the um, the direct uh, the director with uh, the deputy insurance uh, commissioner regarding, um, and they were going to check back with um, the lead agency on behalf of the state regarding um, two matters: indemnification and, and um, as well as could um, ridership that took the um, safety exam and did see a fee, could they get a discount on their insurance because they took a safety test and therefore the fee would become less complicated. They'd actually get a discount, you know, and the fee would become moot. So that was one conversation. And the other one was about um, where does uh, liability come into play based on, um, you know, class six roads, easements, uh, all the things that were I think, and, and I'll defer to the captain because he may, he de definitely knows more than I do, um, that there's still a gray area about, and I think if not a gray area, that there is confusion with landowners, homeowners, riders, where and where, where I can't go and who's liable. And I think that would be an important part of the commission is as well a, if not a law, but also some communication initiatives that I know both trade associations, um, for each respective ridership, OHRV and snowmobile, would be interested in making sure that their riders knew what, where they can ride safely, and it might help them with some of the issues that we do see where riders are going off the trail or uh, awry in easements. So those two I issues were brought up in those discussions with the, um, like I said, with, with the director from Fish and Game and the deputy insurance commissioner. Representative Smith. Thank you. Um, Representative Egan, you had asked what was the status of 1188. It has not yet been signed into law. Okay. I will still feel confident that it will and that this bill should be an integral part of that commission. I don't think we need, I think really what we, the decision that has to be made is do we need a subcommittee for this? And I don't think we do. I don't think we do. And, and I'll we just, make it, we I'll make just look at the captain. If is there anything that I did not reflect or reflect inaccurately? Thank you. And, you know, we're, and so we're really the decision is, uh, is no, no subcommittee. Uh, yeah. One of the um, issues that was brought up in a uh, conversation earlier is that the bill in puts lumps, OHRVs, and snowmobiles in the same category. So in the interim study report, uh, we probably should indicate that that's something that should be separated out. We separated out yep. snowmobile and OHRV statutes a few years ago in uh, legislation. So this part should be in that category also exactly and that's why i think the commission will be able to look at the overlap between the two industries and the and where there needs to be separate policy for them based on you know seasonality um the type of machine you know I, you can't apply one law to everything and that's something i learned very well in in crafting this or attempting to craft this piece of legislation. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, 
Thank mm -hmm. you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if I could ask Captain Eastman a question. Uh, I'm on Equestrian, and we received a request from uh, New Hampshire, I think, Horse Council, that on the training for um, education of the riders, that it include uh, etiquette about what to do when you come across a horse and a horseman on the trail. I don't know if you already do that, so could you comment? Do you already have etiquette in your training for what these snowmobiles and off-track vehicles should do if they approach a horse? Thank you for the question. I, I've just recently reviewed our online uh, course as far as, and there is certainly an etiquette portion in there. Um, the whole course doesn't speak specifically, well, it speaks specifically to multi-use trails. I mean, obviously any any trail out there, um, whether it's a snowmobile or OHRV, is subject to, um, you know, a, a, like dog, you know, certainly horses and, and, and hikers and, and um, you know, dog teams, sled, sled teams, uh, you know, in the wintertime. So there is some of that etiquette. Um, and of course, etiquette as far as stewardship for landowners and, and you know, public lands and things of that nature. Follow up. We'll follow up. Um, Captain Eastman, might I direct the horse council person to speak to you directly? Because I asked them if they had any other uh, comments. I don't trail ride, I show, so I'm not used to what happens when you. But I do see cars uh, causing my horse to have a problem if I'm at a show and they backfire or whatever. So if I can, I'll direct them uh, to talk to you, maybe get some details into you that might help the training. Most certainly, it will okay. take any anything like that. Great, thank you, Captain. Thank you. Uh, moving uh, right along, up with us uh, to House House Bill thank Six. You, thank you, Captain. Thank you. That's House Bill sixteen twenty, uh, which is identifying part of the Merrimack River as a protected river. There's no. Is there anyone here to speak to that? If not, we'll just. If not, we'll just go on. It's. Uh, oh, you you can. It's. I mean, it's just we we just held it there in case somebody uh, comes in and says we got a lot of stuff here that we could you know that we're 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 ready to go or that kind of thing. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for uh, for inviting me back up. Um, I I think that uh, we have heard that certainly uh, folks are interested uh, at some point uh, of talking about bringing in the the, uh, the the middle section, the missing section, yep. the gap uh, of the uh, of the Merrimack into the lakes. lakes I almost said it. Rakes and livers, uh, the lakes and rivers programs. Um, that the. Um, but again, I think that what we heard in testimony and what we've heard, I think, from the local folks is that they're interested in, in going through the process as it's currently set up in statute. Uh, and so, you know, I think that if if this committee were to take up some portion of this bill, it would be the other part of the bill, uh, which which we recommended that if you were going to do something with this, is that the addition of the uh, of that middle section should happen through current statute. But there was this little piece that sits in law that's been in there for 30 years relative to Penichuk Waterworks and the, you know, the ability to withdraw water at certain uh, amounts. DES, we are concerned that given the situation, uh, as we all know, about PFAS in the southern part of the state and the new investments that the communities are making in the southern New Hampshire water connection systems, and I think you're all well aware of, of the new systems that are going in through Salem, uh, down in Wyndham, uh, that are coming, you know, bringing water in, that there may be a need uh, to address that particular piece. Now, whether or not that should be a, a standalone piece of legislation that could be introduced in September and take it up next year, or if that's something that you want to talk about next, next fall, you know that that really truly is up to up to the chair and the, and and the committee, but it's something that probably ought to get addressed at some point. It's not an, it's not critical today. It's not critical this year, but certainly future planning. Um, this is an issue that 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 probably should be addressed. 
and I have Tracy Sales, who's our oh, Lakes and Rivers uh, manager. And, um, and if you have anything to add. Okay. Any, uh, any questions on that? Okay. Uh, again, I won't, I don't think we're going to have a subcommittee on this. I don't believe, but it would be discussed obviously in the, uh, in the executives. Thank you. And thank you. And, um, Ms. Sales and Mr. Deers, um, we received, we were given a letter after the public hearing uh, that Commissioner Scott wrote to uh, Mayor Craig and the Board of Aldermen in Manchester, uh, telling them about this bill and asking for their responses. And I wondered if you knew what had come out of that, if anything. Thank you for the question. Uh, we, we have not received, a, to my knowledge, we have not received a formal response in any manner from either uh, any of the three communities yeah. uh, who received that letter. So it, anecdotally, um, uh, Re Assistant Commissioner Sanborn did hear, you know, that there was some discussion going on and that people were, you know, it sounded like the boards were, nobody was, you know, ruffled that much about it. But I think that we had really wanted something a little bit more than that. Um, and, and we did not get that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, relative to vessel registration fees. Uh, I haven't done lovey. Morning, is it Captain Emeritus or Captain, uh, <laughs> or or did they give you a promotion on the way out? <laughs> are, are you now a are you now a colonel, or a major, <laughs> re re retired? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you well, I think it's just allowing everybody to get back to. Uh, or what this is, what you hear about is uh, we uh, in the discussion originally on this bill, uh, it was we found that uh, you were the uh, uh, the uh, Coast Guard was concerned with the fees, uh, and uh, and we thought maybe this is a good bill, maybe use it as a vehicle to uh, see if like, we can't move the ball along. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That is a, a, a an accurate summary of of what we came before you with uh, at the time of uh, Representative Trotty's bill to look at registration fees. I've given you a one-page handout uh, as sort of an educational tool. It, it references some attachments, but I, I'm not going to burden you with the attachments today. Uh, they're just essentially copies of statute uh, or, or federal code. That being said, um, our concern after a Coast Guard desk audit um, which happens every couple of years as a result of New Hampshire or the Marine Patrol specifically receiving federal monies to help with recreational boating safety. It's called the Recreational Boating Safety Grant, but it's not anything we apply for. It's simply New Hampshire's share that is shared with uh, uh, 56 states and territories uh, in our country with uh, fish and wildlife agencies and agencies responsible for recreational boating safety. Um, the feds disperse that money uh, that comes from uh, taxes assessed on fishing gear, hunting gear, life jackets, uh, all of those things that uh, um, are used by those, those uh, recreators. We have to be compliant, however, with certain things in order to be eligible for those funds. And one of the items that we need to be compliant with is the federal bow numbering system, the federal registration system for recreational boats. And as I pointed out to you, as a result of that audit, it was determined that the state was in violation of uh, federal code when we collected fees unrelated to the boat registration itself. And you'll see in my handout three categories of what a person pays when they register their boat in our state. The top paragraph in 270E is a flat rate fee depending upon the length of your boat. And by statute, those revenues come to the Marine Patrol. In the middle page, and I put a red flag next to it, 
is a series of additional fees that are collected at the time of the boat registration that go to outside agencies. That's what is in violation of federal code um, that, that we are hoping we can come before you and, and, and receive some legislative relief on, on um, the collection of those fees while at the same time we recognize how important those fees are to the agencies that receive them. I think it's pretty self-explanatory where they go um, and when you, when you look at those numbers times 100,000 boats, give or take, depending upon the year, um, those, those revenues are, are important to those agencies. Then in addition, at the bottom are the boat fees that are also in a, in a separate statute uh, that are assessed uh, by mill rate depending upon the length of your boat, the type of your boat, whether it's a cabin cruiser or a sailboat, uh, and how many engines it's equipped with. Uh, the interesting thing is, is the history of those mill rates go back so far that they don't even account for the fact that we now have boats that have three, four, and five outboard engines off the back of them. So um, we thought that perhaps it was time to bring this uh, to a head. Instead of kicking the ball down the field, continuously look at some of these issues. In the early 90s, Marine Patrol was a, a general funded agency. And being seasonal in nature, um, we were scraping the bottom of the barrel every year to provide the services that we had, had come to be expected by the voting public. With the help of the New Hampshire Marine Trades Association, New Hampshire Lakes, and, and an overall awareness by the legislature that, that more money needed to go to boating safety in our state, they created the Navigation Safety Fund which was a dedicated revolving fund where Marine Patrol would receive the revenues of boating registrations. Prior to that, the passage of that bill, the towns that would register boats and the marinas within those towns that would register boats, those revenues went to the town. That was in the early 90s. Unfortunately, an unintended consequence of that is we are now in 2022 it has created a competition for those funds between the state and the towns that are registering boats. And so where there has been no increase since that time in these rates, uh, that competition is now catching up with us. And while the towns do great things with those revenues, um, it, it's time before it gets too late to, to look at this overall registration system. And you'll see at the bottom of the paragraph, the statute where it says, any money that is collected by the town or a boat agent, that being a marina within that town, stay with the town. I've, I've brought Jeff Oberdank here today from the DMV who can speak to where those revenues go and how, they, how they're split up between the state and the town. Um, and, and the overall issue that this system creates with us being able to provide an online renewal service, which the public is screaming for, uh, especially during COVID and even the town clerks. Some want to be involved, some don't, and I'll let Jeff expand on that. But we are here today in hopes that, that we can move forward uh, with some sort of legislative relief, primarily to address um, the, the issue with the, uh, the federal government uh, and, and the eligibility for those funds. We are currently out of compliance, and those dollars are in jeopardy. Happy to answer any questions before I turn it over to Jeff. Any questions for Captain? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Captain Dunleavy. Um, so at the top of the page, we have the registration fees, which top off at $92. And then at the, uh, in section, the third little section, it says boat fees and then see attachment two for tables, uh, and they go up to $1,761 per boat. So I don't, so there are other fees for boats besides the registration? Yes, it, it, it's basically the same thing. It's one's a flat rate uh, that you see at the top, and the bottom is a mill rate. It's like, uh, it's based on the value of your vessel, and it, it declines over five years. Um, so are we using that now? We are. The issue, oh. ma'am, is that 
if I, as the bone owner, register with the town, or in the case of a, a large marina that may winterize and house 4,000 boats, they provide a tremendous service to their customers where they actually will summarize the boat, get it ready for Memorial Day, and register it for them. Or I walk into a marina because I need to buy some life jackets and I take advantage of the fact that, that they also register boats at the marina. My, my check for my boat registration and the mill rate portion of my registration then goes to the town. And so when you look at the significant difference in the amounts or the portion of the fee you pay for boat registration, uh, if it's being, if that transaction is being conducted with an agent other than a DMV substation or Marine Patrol headquarters, those funds stay with the town. And, and for years, that wasn't an issue. But over time, it has caught up because more and more people are looking for um, uh, that ease, if you will, of, of this transaction. Uh, and because of that competition for those funds, again, an unintended consequence, um, to, to go, how, how, do you do, how do you spread those funds out if you go to an online uh, system? And I, I'll, I'll let Jeff speak more to that as he's intimate with those issues. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Mr. Dunleavy said, my name is Jeff Oberdank. I've been with the Division of Motor Vehicles for about uh, 22 years now. Uh, 20 years on the driver licensing side and the last two on the registration side. And um, one of the reasons to the move to the registration side was to seek out efficiencies and better ways to do business in a timely manner and, and, and be more customer service friendly. Um, interesting to me when I started this was that the, the registration process we know for everything we have has to be done in the town you live in. That's where boats are different. Boat registrations can happen anywhere and depending on where you register the boat, as Tim said, that's where the money stays. Uh, and so as an example, uh, when I started, um, I got to know the Town Clerks Association, which we have the president of the Town Clerks Association here today. And one of their asks of us, the DMV, uh, was how do we get boats online? So great, um, I got online driver license renewal, um, online ticket pay. I helped get a lot of those things over the finish line on the driver side. Um, Tim quickly jumped in and said, time out before you rush to get boats online. Um, you're going to take away more of our revenue. And up to 50% of the Marine Patrol budget comes from registrations. So as an example, I just want to run through a couple of numbers here today. In, in 2018, um, agents for the state, which would be boat marinas or town clerks took in about $3.4 million in boat registration revenue. And the Department of Safety took in about $2.4 million in revenue. Um, as COVID hit and people were looking for that convenience and they were looking to do one-stop shopping, um, I'll fast forward to year 2021, the towns took in $4.4 million in revenue and the state took in 1.7. So as you can see, as people seek out those efficiencies and they seek out to be able to do that one-stop shopping model, um, we're taking away a big chunk of Marine Patrol's revenue. And, and from my standpoint, the, the process of tying the registration fees to funding Marine Patrol works out perfectly because here we're in a year where um, last year we registered 107,000 boats which pre-COVID is about 15,000 more than we've ever done in history, right? Everybody wanted to get outside. Uh, boating was the thing to do where you could be with your family and those types of things. So the numbers shot up. Well, 15,000 more boats means that we need more patrol. We need more education. We need more officers on the water. If you have a down year and you're only registering 80,000 boats or so, then you don't need as much money. So tying it to the registration works in that regard historically but where the money goes, depending on who registers it, is the thing that we need to fix. Um, and again, we do have the Town Clerks Association president here as well. Um, we understand moving the, the, the model online. They very much want to provide that service for their citizens. They want to reduce their footprint as well. People don't have to come into the office. 
You can register your car online. Why can't you register a boat online? We've hesitated because of this, and we're hoping that we can hook on to the Coast Guard fixes and the things that they need to moving towards a better funding stream, seeing where things go um, so that we can get the online model that the citizens are asking for. And, and with that, I'll, um, I'll take any questions you may have. Questions by members of the committee? We need a subcommittee. <laughs> Thank you for taking my question. Um, you said the town clerks are here. Have you had discussions with the town clerk about perhaps agreeing on a split percentage instead of they keep their money and you keep your money? If you went online and you just put it all in a pool, I'm just example, you give 60%, the towns get 40%, no matter where the fees come from. It, we have, that's, uh, and that has to be something we pursue through legislation. Um, currently right now, as you see from what Mr. Dunlavey gave to you, it's, it's pretty clear what we can take in and where the money goes based on the two statutes. And we're kind of, the thought process says if we're gonna lift the hood and fix those Coast Guard elements, then let's find a way to get the revenue stream fixed so we can get boats online. Um, this is for uh, Captain Dunlevy, a follow-up. If, if my math is correct, the amount of money that goes to the other state agencies on 100,000 boats is like a million seven hundred. And And I'm wondering, do you have an idea of a suggestion? How would we make up for those agencies the million seven hundred dollars? That's a tremendous question, Representative. Thank you. <laughs> we are we are exploring. Uh, we are not the only state that is wrestling with this issue with the federal government at this time. We are exploring an avenue in which we can still preserve those revenues for those outside agencies and meet uh, the requirements of federal statute. Um, and and so we are working with the Coast Guard on that matter right now. Um, but but what they're using for the litmus test is that if a person walks in to register their boat. And all they want to do is pay what it costs them to be able to get a decal to go out fishing that afternoon. That's what the federal government wants to see. They don't want to have something attached to that transaction that has anything to do uh, with anything but that boat registration. Um, so exploring one lump tax and then behind the scenes dispersing it. They've said you can't do it. It's still going to be in statute saying that's where those revenues go. So uh, we're working with them on a solution. Some states have achieved that, and, and that's where we would be seeking legislative relief and the changes to a, a accommodate those revenues to those agencies. Right. One other quick point, I'll, I'll, I'll point out that it has become known by the towns that here's an availability for, for funds for simply providing a service. And, I, and I'm not, the competition for these funds is not something that Marine Patrol, um, we're against the competition, but we're not against the fact that the towns are receiving these revenues. They use it in tremendous ways on their waterfront, whether they're supporting and repairing uh, and providing town docks, or whether they're uh, helping add additional funds to uh, the fight of aquatic invasive species in their section of their lakes. Um, there are a variety of ways that, that these revenues are being used by the towns and given back to the boater who is shouldering this revenue. Fact is, there are some towns that don't have a single acre of public waters within their boundaries that are receiving revenues from a boat registration. And I think it was the intent of the legislature in the early 90s for that user pays, user benefits system when they provided this dedicated fund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually have two questions, one for the chair and then one for our guests. On um, the question for the chair, do we know who authored this re legislation? Because I don't have it in, or that, sorry. Trottier. Representative Trottier. Representative Trottier. Because I, obviously, uh, as soon as you said online registration, I looked over at Captain Eastman and smiled because that was a previous bill that actually this committee did pass and is going to the governor's desk for OHRV and, and snowmobiles. So I'm very interested in this to sort of make life for our visitors or our state residents 
um, in the efforts of you know promoting tourism easier. So I, I'm interested in see, in it. This bill that came in was the BLM. So it had it had, it had a it was going to be taxing boats by uh, by no rate and uh, it, right. It was just not worth it. It was it was using the mill rate that replied to motor vehicles, and and that that's fine for some boats, but when you look at the value of a, the average cost of a new boat now being maybe thirty to forty for an automobile, you're looking at one hundred to one hundred and fifty for a boat. So for for those that class of boats, it would have been a tremendous tremendous expense. That just so we we're using this bill. Uh, right, while not a good bill, it was the it actually unearthed a good problem to try and solve. Would that be your so my question then for our, either one of you, are there states that are doing this well or have that you both you referenced, you know, that have done this well or have, or have achieved um, looking at this that we as legislators could look at and try and glean some insight from? Certainly the state of Connecticut is just, I'm told by the Coast Guard, uh, a, a pretty good model to follow. And so I, I well, I haven't laid eyes on that model yet. Uh, I do have a call in to make. All right, thank you. Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, there, will, uh, there will be a uh, subcommittee on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. There will be a subcommittee on this. Senator? Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Senator David Waters, District 4. And I appreciate working with the opportunity to work with the Subcommittee, but for the full committee, I just wanted to note a, a couple of things briefly. Um, if you've had a chance to familiarize yourself with the underlying existing statute on burying grounds, you have seen that we already have a process whereby municipalities or others wishing to do something about these burying grounds have to um, contact the descendant community, and if they cannot be identified, do a posting in a newspaper and work with town officials. And as you recall, this bill adds um, the consultation with um, a representative organization of the descendant community. So um, based on your hearing, I just wanted to mention two, two possible things. Um, on line eight and nine, concern about naming the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire. And it occurred to me that we could just do here what we do for Native American graves and let the historical resources designate the representative community. So it could say, or an organization representing representative of the African American descendant community as designated by the New Hampshire Division of Historical Resources. Um, and as I said, that's what they do with Native American graves, and they could certainly figure out who's best for a municipality to consult with there. Um, secondly, uh, if you turn to the second page of the bill, the section at the bottom, lines 33 to 36, about examining collections for remains of African Americans from the period of enslavement, um, that I think that perhaps it makes sense just to keep it to that uh, and on line 33, strike any other and any other remains of people of African descent born after the period of American slavery. And similarly on lines 35, 36. And I recommend this because I think it simplifies it and also because I've become aware that um, there is international treaty language that covers um, materials that may have been removed from African countries whether bones or, you know, remains or a grave good. And the United States is a signatory to that treaty. They have meetings regularly and determine such things as uh, repatriation of, of grave items and otherwise. So there's no point in our, we don't need to do that in state statute. Um, so this would be just be that if you have human remains in 
state, you know, medical collections or in historical societies, and I mentioned, and or at universities, I mentioned before, I do know of at least one case of this, and I suspect there are more. That then this would be an opportunity to uh, do the right thing by those human remains. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to working with the subcommittee. Any uh, questions or comments from members of the uh, committee? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, I don't have the bill in front of me. Could you perhaps cross out on a draft what you want and send it to us or what you're yes, suggesting? I I'll, I'll be glad to do that. Thank you. you. I just realized I was going to hand you this. I said, you're not going to be able to read my writing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I shall. I did uh, uh, I did uh, uh, make copies of this article oh, lawmaker good. slam breaks on protecting the black grave sites I don't know if, uh, if anybody, everybody was able to I open it I wasn't able to open it okay uh, if not uh, here's I know Chuck copies wasn't. of it no uh, you got a copy okay, okay. Anyone, uh, here just, just pass some down Anybody uh, have a copy of it? Here, here's some. Thank you. Okay. Hold that. Just one time. Tim, stop. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you have to get one, Tim? Z Greg? Yeah. Greg, you, you got one? Okay. All right. Uh, it's you know interesting reading. Uh, I did uh, take a you know just last night spent some time just you know going over the bill. The bill actually I didn't even go over all of it. Just uh, but I was just uh, we need it. We do need a, a subcommittee on this simply because we need to hear from uh, the people who are affected, those who are doing the. Uh, uh, the job of keeping up the cemeteries and the grave sites and that. We never heard from them. They, there was no testimony from, of that. And so we need we need that testimony uh, and we need to, so we can judge the impact that uh, this bill might have on them. Uh, and how many graves are we talking about? We don't know. Are there, um, is there any data on that? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of things. I, I, the um, Division of Historical Resources regretted they hadn't been able to send someone to the original hearing because they're the one of the bodies that d that deals with this, um, and as, as well as some local cemetery officials. But again, burying grounds within this funny category because they're not town cemeteries. Um, they are owned by the descendants of the community. As far as how many there are, I don't think we'll hit 100 burial sites for African Americans from the period of enslavement um, that are actually burial sites rather than just single graves. Yes, yeah, but that was going to be my uh, Yeah, my I mean, yeah. There, there are many, many, and re being rediscovered, um, you know, yearly. And if I don't, I can't give an exact figure, but I will say that there were, there were thousands of people enslaved in New Hampshire during the period of enslavement. So there are many, there are thousands of burials, whether or not they have been identified or they're in distinct burial grounds. Um, but this is a lot of the kind of ongoing work of um, black history organizations and local cemetery buffs too. And are you looking, or do you expect that there, there should be a different set of statutes or laws concerning uh, a uh, gra established graveyards versus discoveries of, uh, uh, of of burial grounds that either were lost to history or we didn't even know existed. Because uh, I would assume that the the 
well, the, the whole the whole techniques the necessary to to to, to do what you have to do is uh, is is radically different. Well, thanks for your question, Mr. Chairman. So, if you um, look in um, statute, you'll see that we have kind of two separate areas. One is cemeteries, which are public, yep. publicly or religious organization owned, and then there are burying grounds, which are the property essentially of the people buried there and their, and their descendants. Mm -hmm. And they have a separate statutory language because the town does not own them unless they have voted to take responsibility for them. And most towns won't do that because then they'll have to fence them and pay for upkeep and, and, and so on. There are many African Americans from the period of enslavement who are buried in existing cemeteries. So up in Canterbury, here in Concord, you know, Portsmouth throughout um, the state, there are people, now they may be buried down in a swampy area or sometimes they're buried just outside the wall, but those folks are essentially taken care of by the, by the town. And so this bill um, does not particularly ap ap apply to them. I would think that if a community in its cemetery was going to do improvements or wanted to do a, you know, a particular commemoration or a marking or replace a stone, for an African American who, or who may never have had a gravestone, um, then that they would certainly want to consult with the communities. But this gets this gets at this. The, the, it's a it's an interesting section of law, bearing bearing ground law, because the, the property you know who owns the property is just the it's it's a, you know we have so many of these um, bearing grounds in New Hampshire, uh, and so that's why this. This addresses that because that, frankly, is where most African Americans, period of enslavement, are buried, because um, townspeople did not want them in the public cemetery, or they'd be buried out on the farm, or behind the house where they were enslaved. Um, you know, a funny example, for example, is in Amherst, where there are several African Americans who were enslaved uh, buried. And it's a it, it's odd. It was it was it were they buried in what was then part of the cemetery or not? And then when they built a new meeting house in the 1800s, they built it on top of part of those graves. So, you know, there's just a lot of each one has its own circumstances. And um, you know, I think that because there are people now who have experience in working with these uh, burying grounds in, in New Hampshire, that they um, are happy to provide some expertise and and there are lots of reasons why they should if somebody's doing work in an african burying ground they may not recognize that pieces of shell broken pottery or even um salt sprinkled on top of the uh grave are african practices and they just think they may be trash um so anyways it's just a it's an area that uh in, in statute we could um say hey let's let's uh, include these organizations who kind of know how to respectfully treat the remains of these um these people so Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, uh, I, I can answer a couple ways. Um, you know, if you're doing some work to improve a, a bearing ground, um, that often then there'd be an agreement over how to do that. And that's actually required an existing statute. We already have that, that if you're going to do some work at a bearing ground, you have to get approval from the town. You have a right to do it under statute, but you have, you have to go through a process, and this would also do that. Um, as I said in my opening comments, that it would be, you know, maybe better if you don't want to just name one organization to let the um, historical resources, as it does with, does with Native American graves, find an appropriate representatives of the descendant community, depending on location, tribal affiliation, and so on, to do that. Um, now, the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire has undertaken and has substantial funding for placement of markers and monuments to commemorate African Americans in our state. They just did one over in Warner. 
and I'm trying to remember the other town. Um, and there are others that are, you know, that are un underway. We have a, the, a lot of trail markers in Portsmouth, but now it's going statewide. And so when those are placed, um, they uh, have a bronze plaque that is on a granite boulder that has the information about the individual. And the Black Heritage Trail has a fiduciary responsibility for the maintenance, repair, or whatever is needed on that. On that, so that's that's that current practice. Little clarification. Um, so they, where do they get their funds? Uh, well, um, there are there are grants. Uh, they've received substantial grants from national organizations and mm -hmm. state organizations. Mm -hmm. You go to their website and see their finances. They also. Right raise uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for, I mean, if you participated in a Juneteenth program over the last weekend over Saul when that was all Black Heritage Trail sponsored, and then July 1st around the state, including in Concord, there are gonna be readings of Frederick Douglass's um, 4th of July address. Um, so anyways, you'll, there's a lot of visibility for their programs, but they have uh, the funding that they, they, they raise. They're a nonprofit and they raise money. Great, a final hmm. question. So, uh, to get a lock on it, um, would would this involve in any way funds, uh, state funds going to the Black Heritage Trail or it would be em entirely a private uh, thing in terms of the fiduciary responsibility, it would be an entirely private thing. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Yeah, and just to, to note, any improvement that is done in a bearing ground now right now does not bear any res any financial responsibility from the municipality because the municipality doesn't own it. Great, that's very helpful, thanks. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Not Much appreciated, great. Mr. Chairman. And, and uh, as far as the article, Mr. Chairman, I prefer the word maybe tap the brakes, okay? <laughs> Thank you. That is it, except I uh, do have to, if we have, what, is, what was I saying? One subcommittee on uh, 426 and 257, another subcommittee on the uh, Navigation Safety Fund, and a third subcommittee on 258. I just heard. Uh, now, did, uh, did, I, know, I know we were short quite a few people uh, here. Uh, uh, if people want to call me and uh, uh, send me an email if I want to be on, which ones you want to be on. Uh, I will be at all of them. I will be on some of them. But, uh, you probably I'll be on one. I'll be on some simply because I might not get enough people. So <laughs> when are we allowed to come back to work? Uh, in uh, I think it's the last week in August, the beginning of September. I thought it was September. Yeah, I think, I know September, but I thought it might have been, uh, it might have been the last week in August, right? I remember reading that July, I just I, I thought it was the, the last few days in August. I called it. Uh, I'll, I'll check in the front office. I'll, I'll send something out on that. Maybe that, uh, and people just, uh, and then if uh, it looks like I can't, I uh, don't have enough, I'll draft some people. <laughs> huh? Available. You're available. Anybody but Chuck. <laughs> okay, but uh, and I and I will uh, I will uh, appoint chairs and.
if anybody wants to be a chair. Oh, yeah. Most of September, yeah, I guess maybe. Uh, most September, we're going to be probably doing the most of the work in September, and in October is when we'll be having the plan. Fourteen ninety eight, which is no, that's uh, going to become uh, going to that's going to the eleven eleven eighty eight. Whatever that that book, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, there's going to be that commission. Yeah, we may we may find that we may if that doesn't get passed or that gets vetoed, well then. You know, that then we'll, we'll we, can, we, can, we can revisit, correct? If yeah. it doesn't, oh, yeah, we'll revisit everything we did today was strictly to get our bearings to know where we stand. Uh, the 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 PFAS stuff we went over. I mean, we're basically you as you heard, most of that stuff uh, is we is, uh, you know, PFAS is a very uh, sensitive issue, uh, there, uh, and so we don't want we we, but it's also uh, we feel that the DES has, seems to be on top of it, and it looks uh, so we we'll just carry these along, uh, just to uh, uh, just just to show them the respect that it deserves that they deserve. Uh, Oh well, won't scare you. Yeah, that that sure scares me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, but uh, just uh, make. Uh, I won't. I won't. Uh, I won't put any pressure on anybody. But I. I will be calling around if I don't hear from people. If I don't have enough, I usually want at least five people. Uh, but uh, it can be more. Yes. May very well be. That's the, that is the way. Uh, I, I cannot pr I cannot predict what. Uh, I don't know how it's going to be. It seems like Can't I can't respond to that. I, I'm uh, quite worried because I've been working with you uh, and working with the the weather and we can just continue to do the job of it and um and then we have got the shoreline um you know the things that have to do with the timing and things like that. So I mean if you're gonna do mm -hmm. that I'm quite worried. Okay. You know, That doesn't necessarily what uh, is uh, just because uh, you know what what becomes a law is something different than what becomes a recommendation or uh, a a uh, for instance for instance there may be an issue and we may not like we may say yes there is an issue. But the solution you bring 
so that to that for that issue we cannot handle or we cannot take so uh, so that's that's called politics i mean people you know we we do have you know we, we what we like is not necessarily what is what is feasible No, that no the what we're no uh, the they could they could make suggest suggestions for for what to do and I think they are making suggestions for what to do. We may say we agree that there you we may say that there we agree there is an issue. The solution you give us is not is not feasible. Someone said, "Wait a minute! The Lord said we have trouble doing certain things, but that we're less perfect." So, how do you come up with a solution if you don't know what the problem is? to inspect all the, uh, you know, the, the 
so many, so many times I think I'm sure that I am just happy that this is the part of it, the whole thing is the part of it. But that happens in many ways. I can jump in on that. I don't think I don't think the statute gives the authority to waive it. What they're waiving is home inspections because they do real they're waiving home inspections. But I tell my clients that it, there's a shoreline protection statute that says you have to have this report. Go get the report. Now it doesn't say what you have to do once you get the report. It doesn't say if the report says the system's going to fail, you have to upgrade it. But you you just get the report and you read it, and it, it's signed and it gets filed with the board of health. The question I always brought up, and even listening to Mr. Beers, is, you know, I, I practice both in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. I just keep hearing more things that lead me to think it'll be a Title V, they call it in Massachusetts, uh, septic system requirement. I mean, I'm not totally in favor of Title V. What happens in Mass is every system, before you can sell a house, whether you're shoreline or not, has to be inspected. The inspection's about a 10-page report signed by a licensed inspector, not a installer, but an inspector. That goes to the Board of Health. That gets passed on to the homeowner. And if that inspector says it's failed, yeah, the homeowner has to upgrade it, or the new owner has to upgrade it. You have two years to upgrade it. So what they've been doing in years in Massachusetts is it's a spot thing. If they have a problem here, if it gets found, then somebody's got to fix it. Or you got to tie into the septic system. And they were hoping, and I don't have any test results for you, but the plan was with that put in place, they're correcting all failed systems. And we'll make them upgrade. There's not there's some money from the state for credits for upgrading your system, but I heard uh, Mr. Beers talk about other funds and credits. But I I think the whole discussion is coming to that. Do we really want something like that in New Hampshire? That's what I look at. Yeah, The site assessment plan, which is the all the septic system, all the septic system, all the septic system. If this opportunity is not here, then septic system will continue to pollute these lakes. But people don't want to pollute the lake. They want to get rid of the lake. Um, and I don't think that that's really sustainable. We've heard the problem that. Generationally, when they're they're changed from you know one generation to right. another. I will say, wait, you guys, this is a job for the subcommittee. You know, we're gonna we can be here till next week arguing over the exact same thing. You got your position. We, no, we I mean, well, do it on your own time. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we got the you know. Uh, but, uh, but Chuck, you uh, Yeah, I, it, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to serve on this. In fact, I, I'd like to serve on this committee because I have both experience as being a planner in a shore, in a lakeshore community, and also doing a lot of research on um, uh, private septic systems or innovative septic systems for community, for for private communities and 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 public communities as well. And I think that if you know, we've got these two bills that we're looking at in, in, into one. Uh, that Ted spoke on both of them today. I think there's a, a lot of experience that I can bring to the table as well in, in discussions on these things. And I, being certainly being symp sympathetic to uh, what Judith's argument is, is that you know working in the in a lakeshore community, 
I have seen all kinds of problems with failed septic systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's certainly something that does need to be done with because we're actually paying a lot of money in state funds to treat the, the problem, uh, you know, the effect that these failed systems have. I and mean, we're spending tons of money for dealing with nitrogen in, in Lake Winnipesaukee and other lakes in our state. And much of it is due to failed septic systems. And it's, it's, you know, it's not just water on the waterfront, but within a certain distance from the lake, it, you know, I, I've seen septic systems that are quite a ways from the lake that, are, that were basically leaking right into the, the lake and nobody's inspecting these things and nobody's requiring that they be done. And we need, to, we need to have something that is going to take a look at these and how we do them. I'm not saying, you know, as, as, as Bob said, you know, we may not want to do the whole state, but we want to do something that's within a, a protective area for our lakes and rivers. I haven't found anything, <laughs> but I think uh, we're over. We're running. We're running over, and uh, I think uh, I think we're just petering out. What? Uh, we done? Thank you. Thank you. See you. Don't don't. Thank you. We're adjourned. Let me know who you want. Who wants to be on what committee? You know. Okay. Yeah, I'll talk to you about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah.